Hi everyone, and welcome to the pilot episode for the Wandering in Darkness podcast or video series. Not sure which it's going to be yet. This is one of two projects I'm working on right now. Uh, this one will be individual, and I'm also trying to get a podcast started with a group of friends that will hopefully be getting off the ground shortly here. I thought I would just start by addressing frequently asked questions that I've gotten throughout the years. These have been from guest speaking, online engagement, family and friends, just anybody that's kind of crossed my path and brought up a lot of really similar things that have either confused them or they just kind of wanted some more elaboration on. I figure for this one, I'll just start trying to be basic and to the point, which I think is going to be a little hard for me, but it's going to be some good practice. And then if anything in particular, you know, catches your attention or you want to know more about it, just let me know. And that can be something I might focus on in the upcoming episodes. As a little bit of background, I was raised in a Jewish family. Reformed mostly, but somewhat conservative, conservative in some ways. I think I was probably around 16 when I started questioning the idea of, you know, an all powerful, all loving being like a lot of us probably have. And like a lot of us probably did, it drove me right to atheism. You know, I thought since the God I was raised with didn't exist, gods didn't exist, period. And I hadn't really been overly exposed to a lot of things outside of that, which is nobody's fault. I mean, very few of us are exposed to polytheism or anything like that as anything more than a fiction or something silly that people believed in the past. It's usually either, you know, monotheism or physicalism. I was an atheist for the end of high school and the start of college. Um, I considered myself a Satanist for a while, kind of in the tradition of Anton LaVey, you know, Satan is a symbol and just kind of, you know, an edgy form of atheism where everything is kind of, you know, it's make-believe magic and stuff like that. And then it was in college, between where I was working at the time and my, once I chose a program, I chose psychological science. So that program, I really started to question the idea that the mind reduced to the brain and that matter is all that exists. And that got me much more heavily into all the stuff I'm kind of into now and talk about now and that we'll get into here. I started a very, very small group very briefly with a friend or two in the early 2010s called the, we called it the Order of the Dawning Sun, which, you know, if you go and find that, I have links to it, but it doesn't really describe anything I believe at this time, but it does give a good insight into kind of that, what we call psychological occultism take you know, where you come in from atheism and practice psychodrama and things like that, but don't really believe in anything beyond the material world. Then in the late 2010s, um, a couple friends and I started the Order of the Serpent, which put out a couple newsletters and a, a PDF that was kind of a book, kind of an extended newsletter. That went on for about three years. It was a pretty fun experiment. Um, but since then, you know, I've kind of got my individual way and just been working really with my own personal friends. I've been very lucky that the friends I've kept from, you know, high school and early college are all into these types of things, which makes life a hell of a lot easier. That basic background aside, let's start with the questions. Question, the first question, do you actually believe in multiple gods? Yes, I do. Um, I think it's, it always makes me laugh because people are so surprised at this, despite the fact that people have been believing in multiple gods for far, far longer than people believed either in one God or that there are no gods. You know, our ancestors, that's where we come from. That's our background. It's by far the most report reported, you know, theistic reality is that there's more than one God. And it's only in the last, it's been longer, but the last 2000 years, really monotheism took off, of course. And now I think people just don't really even take polytheism seriously. And I think it's usually for bad reasons. 
for example, one of the most common things I'll hear is how can you believe in a God of storms? You know, we know how storms are caused. That doesn't need to be explained by God. And I would say that at best, that type of logic is what we'd call a low hanging fruit. You know, like back then human beings knew a lot less than we did about reality. There's no denying that. And I don't think that we could deny the, that people who weren't initiated into the priesthood of their religious traditions did very literally believe that storms were caused by storm gods. But not only historically speaking, but especially in the modern day, that's not at all what we mean when we talk about a god of storms. And I think for comparison, you could call a friend of yours fiery, you know, say they have a fiery personality. And you wouldn't be implying that your friend is the source of fire, that you must pray to your friend before you light a fire. It just means that the properties of fire and the properties of your friend line up in symbolic ways. So when we talk about something like a storm god, we're not saying a god that creates the storms and that you pray to to bring the storms. We're talking about a god whose nature resembles the symbolic nature of storms. You know, they might be turbulent. They might be blindingly bright, but exceedingly dark. They might bring flood and destruction, or they might bring fertility and growth. But we're never talk we aren't talking about a being that explains why storms exist. Storms are simply a symbol of that being. I also firmly believe that monotheism doesn't make a lot of sense. That's probably one of the biggest questions is if you believe in God, why would you believe in more than one? And it always surprised me because it seems like one is a much bigger leap than many. For example, the problem of evil is a really good way to look at it. That if God was all loving and all powerful, evil wouldn't exist because evil existing implies that the God either cannot stop it or does not want to, which respectively would mean he was not all powerful or all loving. And of course, evil very clearly exists in some form, whether you want to say that evil is something we humans define or morality is objective. But if you have many limited gods, some gods who outright are openly evil, then the problem of evil poses no problem, for instance. And so it's frustrating to then see the problem of evil always used to argue atheism, when in reality, all it does is refute a very specific form of monotheism and a comparatively very recent one. The next question is, why did you leave atheism and what made you believe gods exist? I want to start kind of with the logical, evidential type arguments before I get into personal experience. And I've actually had to record this a couple times just because brevity is supposed to be the point. So first, I think that the fact humans in all times and cultures have experienced gods is some of the best evidence that those gods do exist. I understand why individual experience does not prove anything, but we're talking about a common human experience that occurs up into this present day. I also think the fact that people experience so many different gods implies polytheism over monotheism because monotheism ends up having to special plead that only experiences of their god or that are in line with their god's religion are valid and no other experiences. I think the fact that consciousness and matter have mutually exclusive properties such as matter taking up space and consciousness not taking up space, or matter being deterministic and consciousness, consciousness being autonomous, show that consciousness and matter are two very separate things, especially the higher consciousness as experienced by human beings. The way that higher consciousness rose abruptly in the Upper Paleolithic Revolution 160,000 years after our genetic evolution as a species, and the fact that what it gave rise to 
changed us so much from nature and gave us mutually exclusive properties to material nature to me imply the intervention of something like a god. And that is not to deny evolution. I absolutely believe evolution. I just don't think evolution can explain the leap forward in high, higher consciousness and the nature of that high, higher consciousness as we know it today. And I'm speaking of the empirical nature we can deduce when investigating this higher consciousness compared to the material world. For example, if you had a dead body in a room, it would take up as much space of a body of the exact same size in a room that was taking a test using its conscious properties, or as someone imagining amazing vistas, such as the Lovecraftian dreamlands. Or if you had the most intelligent person in the world thinking about the most difficult problem in the world and then put them under anesthesia, their body would take up the same amount of space whether they were conscious or not, and no matter the level of that consciousness, because the properties are mutually exclusive. I think the different ways that gods have been interpreted through cultures just show that we're dealing with limited and multiple beings rather than an all-powerful deity. I like to say that when atheists tell us the different ways gods are interpreted is evidence against them. This is like arguing that the stars do not exist because different cultures saw different constellations in them. We're talking about cultures subjectively experiencing and reporting abstract forces beyond our full comprehension. And there's no reason to think those wouldn't be different unless God was all powerful and all loving and wanted a relationship with us. In which case he should just prove himself irrefutably to the world at large. I also think it's interesting that people report afterlives in consistency with their own beliefs. Again, it may not be convincing to the atheist, but as far as theism is concerned, this suggests different possible outcomes based on your tradition to me, rather than one proper tradi tradition one must follow or face certain eternal consequence for. All the logic and evidence aside, I've had many experiences with gods myself, both individually and with other people. And other people in my group have had these experiences as well, both individually and together. And this is something that you will find is pretty consistent throughout history. People reporting multiple limited gods. And I think a, a funny thing that people say is that the gods of polytheism are too human-like. But honestly, our biggest problem is that humans are too godlike in some ways because being a god does not inherit to inherently imply a goodness or a rightness or anything of that sort. The next question is what are the stellar traditions in Western left-hand path? I think the best way to describe the stellar tradition is to look at the Northern stars. They never rise and set. They're always in the sky. You know, they're eternal. Compare this to the sun, which rises and sets which blinds you to all other lights in the sky, which dries up the land and causes droughts in the desert, which the planets themselves, their lights depend on it. These are very different symbolic concepts, even if you don't accept anything esoteric or don't accept theism or anything like that. So for instance, the stellar tradition and Western left-hand path believes that we are gods ourselves, our souls are at least, and that we have an inherent immortality, much like those circumpolar stars never needing to die or be reborn or depending on anything else. Compare this to the solar or Western right-hand path traditions, which believe that all our, 
all our quote unquote light or our soul, whatever that may be, comes from something else, whether it's the one God or material processes. Western religious traditions generally, generally revolve around concepts such as death and rebirth and a reliance on a God of light for that death and rebirth, lest you cease to exist or suffer eternally or something like that. With the left-hand path, it seeks for one to become an individual, to do their own thing, as well as to let others do their own thing, perhaps encourage them to, but I don't think that's necessary. That's necessary. Compare this to the right-hand path, which seeks, you know, for a religious example, to follow the status quo of a church or a mosque or a temple. Compare it to a secular drive to have the same new phone as everybody to get the best new thing, you know, to consume the proper content. The left-hand path seeks what Carl Jung would call individuation or Abraham Maslow would call self-actualization. Whereas the right-hand path wishes to control what you individuate or self-actualize into. So I guess it would be more appropriate to say the Western left-hand path is about self-actualization and individuation in accordance with one's own will rather than the will of something else. The solar right-hand path traditions are always very culture focused. They usually defend, define the status quo, what's appropriate to talk about. For example, the pull between monotheism and physicalism in our world is what defines polytheism as inappropriate to seriously consider, despite the fact that it seems more likely than both alternatives. The Western left-hand path is apathetic to culture, as in it doesn't seek to align with culture, nor to shock culture, but more doesn't care at all what culture says about their values. And so if your, cult, if your values align with culture, great. And if they don't align with culture, that's also great. The definition of the Western left-hand path is that you're doing this of your own will and not because of what culture wants you to do. And by culture here, I can mean anything from your religious tradition to modern materialistic scientific culture to your family culture to your work culture. I would say that the left-hand path has much more of a respect for subjective experience and individual will. I think that's actually why a lot of us who are theists tend to be polytheists because we don't believe that our experiences define everything. Whereas both the monotheists and the physicalists do, you know, they believe that their experience of a one true God is so real that polytheism is only wrong, but historically it needs to be destroyed or cut out of society. And physicalism, physicalism is honestly the same way because it takes all those divine experiences and says that the lack of experience of gods overrides them all. I think the left-hand path focuses on rejecting dogma, or more importantly, dogma is self-created. You know, I have personal dogmas of things I won't, will and will not do, but it's not because I was told to do or not do those things, but because I've decided to do or not do those things. The right-hand path, of course, is all about dogma. You have to follow the proper etiquette and the proper beliefs and the proper rituals or things could end up very bad for you, which is not something that really happens with the Western left-hand path. I think there's a focus on oneself and their most close loved ones. I think the stellar tradition doesn't really come with a requirement to take care of everything and everyone in the world. It doesn't have to oppose that. You can absolutely be you know, altruistic. And there's arguments to be made that all altruism, of course, is selfish at its core because, you know, in the very least, it makes you feel better about yourself. And in that sense, I guess I would say the left-hand path understands that selfishness is just a sliding scale. There's positive and negative selfishness. It's not 
selfishness versus altruism. So I think it's important and common for those people to have a few close associates and really focus in on caring for that group as if it's a small tribe as opposed to society as a whole. I also think the Western left-hand path and solar tradition allow for pragmatism and doubt. You know, if something doesn't work for you, try something else. You don't have to do things in a specific way. And you don't have to believe things blindly or on faith. Doubt is honestly critical. It's encouraged as opposed to being heretical or sinful or fringe, to use the physicalist version of that same exact concept. And most importantly, I think that the left-hand path in solar tradition sees us as gods, as sovereign and powerful and divine individuals, not as something to bow to other gods or something subservient or just mindless creatures here by accident meant to struggle the best we can through life. It sees us as something much more than that. Next question is, what is the soul? <clears throat> I think if you say the phrase to yourself, I exist, the soul is the I that is speaking and being referenced to. I think that the existence of this soul cannot really be questioned or doubted. There's no way that you can argue, I don't exist. You can't have a dream with no dreamer, you know? In this sense, I would say the soul, or at least the self, is what we'd call in logic axiomatic. It cannot, there's nothing, it doesn't even have to be argued. It's a base fact of reality, you know, same as that A is A and not non-A. It's also interesting because to know anything at all, we need to have this self, this I, this soul. It is, it is necessary to be aware of anything, and we're axiomatically aware because we know I exist. Therefore, consciousness itself is kind of a necessary thing. We briefly touched on it, but consciousness is not reducible to matter. We know consciousness directly and we only know matter through that consciousness. And not only that, but we cannot question our consciousness as just discuss. I exist cannot be false. You can't even argue it. But we can doubt the existence of matter. I mean, this is what philosophical skepticism has done. It's what the brain and the bat argument does. It's what simulation theory does. And we cannot reduce what we know directly to what we know through it or reduce what we know with certainty to what we can doubt. Therefore, we cannot reduce consciousness to matter. It's irreducible. We can't reduce it to anything, honestly. It doesn't reduce to a god either. You know, it, it, we can't argue that we are an emanation of something because I exist is, is axiomatic and necessary and irre, irreducibly true. And so it couldn't possibly be that you're an illusion and just a manifestation of something else. The soul or self is immaterial. You know, it cannot be seen, touched, tasted, heard, or smelt. It's not accessible to others. It's not deterministic the way material nature is. And because I do not exist cannot even be argued, or arguably conceived, then as far as we can ever tell, the self is something eternal as well, or at least the soul is. This leads me to the conclusion that the soul, the I, when you say I exist, is itself something we would call a God because it is axiomatic, it's necessary, it's irreducible, it's immaterial, and it is eternal. Now, this may not be true. Maybe one of these is a false observation, but as far as we will ever be able to tell in this life, at least, this is what appears to be true.
Who is the god Set or Setesh or Seth or Sutek? He is a prehistoric deity that's been around for longer than human history, who is associated with those northern circumpolar stars we were speaking about before. And so as a god of these, these Western left-hand path and so tradition ideals of the self as a god and, you know, doing your own thing, individuality, deification, things of that nature. He was associated with the darkness and storms as opposed to light. And so is sometimes seen as a god of darkness. He was also associated with the harsh and mountainous deserts, the oases in those deserts, and all things foreign to Egypt, whether that was from Earth or from outside of Earth in the divine realm. Satesh was the equal of a god named Heru, or more popularly known as Horus. And neither was seen as good or evil or anything like that in the beginning. They were more like the yin and yang. They were very much a balance and center of all things. A dualistic center of all things, of course. And it's too much to say, actually, that they were a center of all things. They were a center of light and darkness. But there were more forces out there than just the two of them. Egypt was very hard polytheism, despite modern attempts to make it monotheistic. He was very closely related with Jehudi, also known as Thoth, who was sometimes his child, sometimes just a close associate, who stood with him in his bid for kingship against Horus, the child. Jehudi was also a god of writing, wisdom, mediation, things of that nature. He's very associated and known in the occult today because of his association with the Greek Hermes. And later on, after Set kind of fell from grace, Jehudi took over his positive roles. And so later can almost be seen as one of the same with the positive aspects of Satesh. When the solar religion started to rise in Egypt during the fourth-ish dynasty with the popularity of Ra, Set lost a little bit of his power. He was relegated to be under the sun god, but still a positive being, so he would lead Ra's boat every night as it journeyed to the underworld and fight back the primordial chaos in the form of a great serpent in, named Apep. But then in the fifth dynasty came Asar, also known as Osiris. And we don't know really where he came from or why the Osirians did what they did, but they completely changed the story to where Osiris was the king of the gods instead of kind of an equal form of polytheism, because before that, there could be contradictory myths and rankings of the gods and creation stories, and it was not a problem. It was Osiris, Asar, was the first one to come in and really say, I am the king of the Egyptian gods. He made session, uh, Satesh into his violent, hate hateful, murderous brother. He changed the great Horus into his own child. He stole Satesh's wife, Nebethet, or Nephtis, and his son Anpu or Anubis, through a story where Nephtis commits adultery with Osiris and they conceive Anubis. And so it's really the first example we have of a god coming in and demonizing its peers and casting things out and rewriting history in their own favor to be above all others instead of one amongst the thousands of gods. It wasn't all bad for Satesh. It wasn't actually until after the New Kingdom, that which is like post 20th dynasty, that he completely fell out of favor. He appears in the pyramid text, the coffin texts, in positive manners. He was worshipped greatly in the 18th to 20th dynasties, both before and after the first reign of the monotheist, but both before and after the reign of the first monotheist, Akhenaten. And then even after he fell from grace in his Egyptian form, he was worshipped in Gnosticism as the serpent, as possibly the Gnostic Seth, 
and arguably even as the Gnostic Christ, though not Christianity, Christianity's Christ as we know him, of course. And then it was really in the 20th century that Satesh was rediscovered with the likes of Aleister Crowley and then Kenneth Grant and Michael Aquino. And that's kind of where we are now. Academia for a long time kind of agreed with the view that the myth of Asar, the Osiris myth, was the kind of one truth of all of Egypt as Christianity was during the Dark Ages almost. But this was... Never the case for Egypt. It didn't really work like that. A lot of modern esotericism is still caught up in that outdated knowledge of Egypt, but academia is definitely coming around. And some of the best books I could recommend on Satesh would be Deconstructing the Iconography of Set by Ian Taylor, um, Images of Set by Joan Lansbury, or her website, her Set Find website. There's Seth, a misrepresented god in the Egyptian pantheon, I forget his last name, but I believe his last name is Turner. And there's many more. I have I have a lot of lists out there, and I can post one in the description. As, I can post my list in the description as well, just to kind of give more of those recommendations. But a lot has come around since our understanding of set that the esoteric tradition picked up in, you know, the early 1900s, late 1800s. And I like to say that I don't care so much what people in the late 1800s thought about Egypt. I care what the Egyptians thought about Egypt, you know, and it's turning out to be very different. And it seems like there is a move within the occult traditions to get away from that Osirian type focus, but it's a very, very slow process at best. And the next probably long-winded question, what do you enjoy about working with Satesh? I just feel like him and I are on the same page, which is why I took him as my patron. You know, we're both kind of misunderstood outcasts. We're both kind of foreigners. You know, I was raised Jewish in a Christian culture. I was a poor kid at a rich high school. I was, I am a polytheist in a monotheistic and physicalist culture. We're set, Satesh and I are both, can be both very chaotic. You know, we can have our good sides and bad sides. There's the light side and dark side. You know, as much as we can be associated with something like defending the sun from non-existence, we can be associated with something like a violent, abrupt storm, which I think has definitely been reflected in my works and kind of public persona of the past decade or so, at least. I've always been associated with the desert and night sky. I grew up, I've lived my whole life in a desert. And so I really associate with that early stellar tradition where the sun, you know, is kind of an enemy and it scorches and burns and blinds out all other lights. And there's nothing we love here more than a cool night or a nice storm, you know? I also just love that my work with him has been consistent. Results are so important. I think there's a very scientific aspect to what we do if you're doing it right. And consistent results and outcomes and changes, especially for the positive, are always a great reason to believe something, of course. And that actually wasn't too long when <laughs> What other gods do you work with? Like I mentioned, I work with Jehudi, also known as Thoth, god of writing, wisdom, things like that. I have a very scribal nature, and I've kind of taken on a a modern priestly role, you know, to redeem these gods from the muck they've been drowned in. And I don't mean to proselytize or anything. I more just want to reach out to other polytheists and help them kind of understand why what they believe is not only valid, but probably right despite the fact that it gets ignored or laughed at incorrectly by society. And so I think Jehudi is a big part of that role. I do a lot of work with Nehushtan, as it's known in the Torah, which I do believe is kind of a manifestation of Satesh and Jehudi. You know, it's associated with those medical staffs of Hermes, and there's a lot of associations between Asherah and Satesh and his wives, like Astarte like and 
uh, a knot, sorry. And then those wives of Satesh are also big workings. They're kind of the female side that I work with. So like a Sarte, a Shara, a knot. They come from the same tradition, you know, as Ishtar and Inanna and then Lilith and the Hebrew. Next question is, what exactly is magic? Now, this was a hard one I had trouble coming up with an answer for, but I think I have one. I think I would define magic as individuation and self-actualization by one's own will in a way that transcends the mundane world of matter. When I was part of the Order of the Serpent, we used to just call it self-directed self-evolution. You know, not evolving in the way of somebody else or in just a purely biological sense, but by one's own divine will. It's not actually Crawley's definition of magic, but he had a slogan that I think is a good definition for magic, which is the method of science, the aim of religion. And that goes back to what I was just saying before about results and practice and outcomes and things like that. I think a key to understanding it is that it's both subjective and objective in a way, because magic is very practical and it will depend a lot on the individual. I think a common misunderstanding is that you need to do specific chants or movements or ritual to do magic, when in reality, magic is just a part of everyday life. You know, in ancient Egypt, it wasn't even it wasn't even a verb, it was a noun, magic, hekka. But I think the key is that it's by your own will. You know, if you do something because your parents wanted you to, I don't think that's magic. Or at the very least, it wouldn't be left-hand path or stellar magic. It would be part of the solar magic. You know, you're conforming to someone else's direction they want you to evolve in. So yeah, it's... It's like, a, I think that's a good way to put it. It's just this individuation, individuation and self-actualization by your own will and above the material world. So not just to be more rich or to have a bigger house. We're talking about to connect with the gods or with others on a spiritual level or to ask the big questions of life. How did you get involved in magic? Huh. <laughs> In my notes here, I kind of broke it down into five stages. The first stage was as an edgy teen when I was an atheist. I just thought it was, you know, cool and dark and made me badass. But then that led to stage two, which was success from some of those magic practices, even just on a psychological level, being a materialist. When I was a year or two into college, I started a job in a movie theater that was on an Indian, reser Indian reservation and very haunted. And that definitely got me leaning, that helped me lean more into this kind of spiritual side of magic again, like ghosts and spirits and things of that nature. And then when I picked my undergraduate program of psychological science, it just really opened my eyes that we weren't re well reduced. You know, the mind isn't, doesn't just reduce to the brain like we were talking about that we are more than our bodies, that there's more to this than matter and deterministic physical processes. And that led much in the same way as the original magic had accidentally led to psychodramatic success. This accidental realization, thanks to my scientific studies, led to esoteric success, which has just kind of snowballed since there and really demonstrates like the past five years, especially of my journey. This one I know specifically was a Reddit question. How do the gods interact? I have no idea. <laughs> I think that's a really good question. It's something I'm definitely gonna be thinking about a lot, but I cannot come up with a good answer. And I don't think that matters too much. For example, you might object that because you cannot explain how the gods interact, they do not exist. But even if you look at a common belief today, like that, like physicalism, like that the mind reduces to the brain, we have no idea how the mind would reduce to the brain or be created by such a brain, but people still believe it. And it's possible that it's true. 
It could be completely true that the brain causes the mind and we just don't know how. But we also, since there's nothing wrong with that, we definitely shouldn't just assume how. And I definitely will be pondering this question and have to come back to it. Who is the demiurge? The demiurge is generally defined as a, a one of the gods, specifically the one that has tried to cast down the other gods and teach humanity that it is the one and only true God. So a slightly indelicate way of putting it might be that the demiurge is the God that most people in our monotheistic world are worshiping. There's a lot of debate whether this being created the material world or simply messes with it in a way to, you know, cause suffering and imprison humanity. But it's generally agreed, at least as far as Gnosticism goes, that the being is evil. And some things that it believes it really is the one and only God and it's just trying to help us and it's just ignorant of higher natures. But I definitely believe that it knows full well what it's doing, the same as, you know, any human tyrant who would tell you that their way is the one best way and try to punish you if you didn't disagree with them, or if you didn't agree with them. I feel like we can see this demiurge very clearly throughout history. You know, first it, it started with Osiris or other similar gods like Zeus who come in and say that they are the king of the gods and you don't want to mess with them, you know, otherwise you might get slandered, seriously, especially in mythology. And then this being was braver during the reign of Akhenaten when it was the Aten, the same being, Osiris and the Aten, trying something new instead of, I am king of the gods, I am the one and only god. And while it didn't work during the reign of Akhenaten, it definitely worked in the long run, especially for the past 2,000 years, of course. You can also just see the interference of such a being in the nature of the world. It can be something minor as though, you know, you always do your dishes and laundry and then they pile back up again. You know, it's almost like a petty or weak beings attempt to mimic infinity, but instead it's just cyclical. Or you might see it on a more macro level, such as how for any life to exist in this material world, it requires the destruction of other life. We require the destruction of other life, whether we eat plants or animals. It's just unavoidable. There's, there's no way to avoid suffering and death and almost a natural oppression in this world. And a lot of Gnostics, myself included, would probably argue that's because this world is being influenced or even set up by this you know, evil, limited God trying to take all the power for itself. Probably the most common question, are you a Satanist? No, I am not a Satanist, not at all. I would first say that there is no such being as Satan. Uh, this was a being essentially fabricated mainly for Christianity, but it did start late in Judaism after capturing Babylon because of, you know, Zoroastrianism. But there is, there is no being named Satan. It's kind of a boogeyman for monotheism. On top of that, I would say that when people do honor Satan, they're conflating him with beings that he doesn't, that are not the devil. You know, the serpents in the Garden of Eden, the serpent in the Garden of Eden was not the devil until he was written as such, until Satan was made up and associated with that serpent. Likewise, Prometheus is often associated with Satan because he stole the light from Zeus and was punished for it, much like the serpent stole, or sorry, much like the serpent gave Adam and Eve the apple in the Garden of Eden, or the fig, or whatever it was. But that association between Prometheus and Satan again relies on that false association between the serpent and Satan. You know, these are different beings. And so I actually have come to oppose the use of Satan in this positive polytheistic way, because to me, it seems like we're fitting our deities into a Christian box, you know, and it's a box they never wanted to fit in. They, they would have never wanted to be cast down and demonized and hated 
by the world at large. So I think the problem comes in for Satanism is that, well, first, if you're an atheist and a Satanist, I just don't see any reason to say that. That's not what Satanists meant until very recently, and it definitely was not a definition of it, or it definitely, Satanism is definitely not something made up, you know, in the 1960s. But it's also a problem for the theist because we shouldn't help in the demonization of our gods. And I like to say, if I was found guilty of murder incorrectly, it was all over the news, you know, everybody ingrained it in them that I had killed somebody. And then the evidence came out 10 years later that I was innocent, I was freed. Well, I would want people to acknowledge that I was not a murderer and be very offended if people insisted that I was, despite having been, you know, redeemed. And I don't see any difference between that and calling our gods by their real names and acknowledging their real characters and not calling them by the demonized names given to them by their enemies. Alternative question, what, what is your issue with Satanism? Well, I think I, I just answered that, I guess, especially from a theistic perspective. Briefly from an atheist pers atheistic perspective, I just don't see a lot of Western left-hand path ideology and atheistic Satanism. I think a lot of it is just kind of pop psychology and pop occultism. And, you know, it's really sad to have seen that consumerism, consumerism is almost central to Satanism. Now, you know, you need the bumper stickers and the plushy Baphomet and the cool t-shirts. And so I don't really want to get too deep into this, but that's just kind of, I feel like that kind of covers it enough for now. If people want to know more, I can dive in more, but I just kind of come to see Satanism as either an edgy form of atheism or kind of a, confume, a confused form of theism, and I'd like to help clear up that confusion. Do you believe in the devil at all? If there is a devil, it is the demiurge, in my opinion. And that's all I really feel like I need to say on that for this video. How do you view Michael Aquino in the Temple of Set? Uh, first of all, I have never been a member of the Temple of Set, and I never have or never will speak for the Temple of Set because while I respect that organization for what it is, it's not something I've been a part of. And so anything I ever say should never be taken as the TOS view, just for, just for the record. Aquino himself was a big inspiration to me, especially in the past. I think he really helped me break through my materialistic mindset and show me why this more esoteric path was more reasonable. Overall, as time goes on though, he's definitely become more of a second secondary inspiration, I guess. And I don't want to, you know, talk bad about the guy, but there's definitely a lot of his important ideas that I very much disagree with. For example, he had a theory that the name Satan came from an Egyptian term set hen, meaning the eternal set. And that isn't that that's not a thing. That's definitely those are very different languages that are not connected in that way. I think that some of his work with the Book of the Law was a little too egotistical, I guess. You know, I'm always hesitant when somebody takes one of the riddles of the Book of the Law and finds their own name in it, for instance. Though I do like his commentary overall, I think they're very useful if you get something like Don Webb's book, Overthrowing the Old Gods. But most importantly, I definitely am not supportive of Aquino's more political stances, I guess, on what he called mind war. You know, I think it's very interesting in theory, but I don't think it jives with kind of left-hand path values or goals or anything like that very well. What is your relationship with Kemetism? And if you don't know, Kemetism is like Egyptian revival religion. Uh, my religion is pretty 
bad with it. They don't usually like people who are working too closely with Satesh because they're still very tied to that Osirian ideal of Satesh as an evil, violent monster. And it's really unfortunate because some of us who honor Satesh have actually been banned from places like on Reddit, for instance, that discuss chematism for quote unquote fascism, because people literally cannot separate Satesh from not only Satanism, but the worst kinds of Satanism out there that are Satanism in name only, you know, and don't, don't connect with the values or anything at all because they're fascist and they're authoritarian. So it can be pretty hard to find people of a like mind because those who work with the Egyptian deities usually aren't very interested in Satesh as anything other than a minor evil god. Which is fine because I've actually come to the conclusion that the term Kemetic doesn't really make sense for worshippers of Set or those who honor Set anyways because that's kind of the Delta Osirian area, you know, that was the black land where the soil was fertile, whereas Set was the red land of the deserts, Deshret. Uh, Deshretism doesn't really roll off the tongue, but if somebody wants to come up with a better term for that, I think that would be really cool and exactly what we need right now. Do you believe in good and evil? Uh, yes, I do. I do think that there is objective good and objective evil. I think the simplest way to define evil is the violation of another's will. So if I, if you murder somebody, you're violating their will and this makes murder immoral because they couldn't choose what to do with their own, you know, body. They didn't get to follow their own will. They were slave to your will. Another example would be assault. You know, if you assault somebody in ways that I don't think you're actually allowed to say on YouTube, but it's a violation of their will. You know, that's what differentiates a, a beautiful encounter from a violent assault. It can be something as simple as consent, that free will. But it doesn't just apply to individuals interacting with other individuals, you know. Tyranny is evil because it forces the will of the state over the will of the individual. It doesn't respect free will. Consumerism is evil because it likewise doesn't it not only doesn't value individuality, but, or one's free will, but actively opposes it because it wants everybody to buy the same things and be on the same page and to give them money and be the biggest corporation. A lot of work cultures out there are evil. They don't care what their employees need or anything. They only care what they need from their employees, which is why you usually see yourself forced to assimilate to a company culture rather than a culture that tries to account for the diversity of its workers. Monotheism is another example of this in some cases where if you don't have the right will, you can downright be punished eternally, miserably tortured forever just because you followed your own will, even if you didn't do anything bad to anybody. And even family can be this, you know, family can force us into things we don't want to be. And that happens probably in a lot of cases, which I would say isn't always evil, but can definitely border and reach that line and get far too close to crossing it. What does the afterlife look like? Uh, so I think the afterlife is self-created. And I think you either have to willfully create it or your subconscious is going to do it for you. So I say, for example, if you believe that you're a sinful being and you haven't done enough to be forgiven for that, to be forgiven for being sinful, you might doom yourself to a self-created hell without ever having another choice, which is why I warn away from beliefs such as that. But if you want to control what the afterlife is, you have to, you know, visualize it and imprint it in your mind, both conscious and subconscious, you know, meditate on it and go there, you know, astrally or spiritually or whatever you want to call it. And I think the key to it is that you're kind of a 
this is where deification really occurs. You know, we don't become a god of this world. We can we become a god of our own world, which I like to compare to like Lovecraft's Dreamlands or the Realms of Oblivion in the Elder Scrolls games. And so just like some brief examples, I wouldn't get too much into mine, but for instance, I know my afterlife rests on a high cliff above a stretching desert, a desert filled with many, many unique places and people. Again, I would reference the Lovecraft Streamlands. You know, there's a trapezoidal black and purple temple to Satesh at the top of the mountain, a forest going off to the side. You know, all the pets that you loved and the people that you would spend eternity with. And it's funny because I can picture the world much more closely than I would ever describe it because it's a very personal thing. And yet once you get inside that temple that's there, it's just a bit too much to wrap your mind around. It's, it kind of feels like the place where my personal world and that higher reality that is Satesh kind of meet and I don't think I'll be able to fully picture it till I'm there one day. Not that there's any rush. What do your family and friends think? Uh, most of my family has been really supportive. I think some people had concerns and questions at the very beginning when I was like reading the Satanic Bible at 16 and all anybody knew of Satanism was Satanic Panic type stuff. Uh, you know, all my family knows, my friends know, my wife knows. And they've either accepted me for it or they're long gone and I haven't thought twice about it because that's not really your fault if people can't handle you being you. That's just the right hand path society we live in, whether it's monotheistic or physicalist or whatever. I actually say that most of my closest friends are similar minded. I don't belong to any occult order or anything like that. What I have instead is a small group of friends and we talk. We were actually just complaining that our esoteric text group you know, blows up too much sometimes. There's, you have to mute it sometimes because you're busy doing stuff. And we kind of realized that that's one of the dumbest things you could ever complain about. I mean, that's kind of the dream. And to be able to just do it so freely without having to worry about like, oh, can I get the next degree? Or, oh, am I going to piss off the Magus or whatever? I think a lot of outsiders have been scared, but are more open to it now. And I think that's honestly just my own fault because... I presented as an edgy, you know, atheistic Satanist for a long time. And now I don't associate myself with any of that stuff, really. I, I'm a polytheist, which I think there's people are more interested in. I'm spiritual and an occultist, which I think there's a lot more interest in now. And people separate that from like, oh, like devil worship. And of course, I already, already explained my, you know, views. If people still have questions, like hopefully this will be a good video to direct them to and be like, well, here's kind of a place to get started. But yeah, my family and friends, the ones, they're either, you know, they're supportive and love me and I love them and support them or they aren't around anymore and who cares? What's with the geometric shapes? Uh, the big ones, trapezoids, I associate it with the mastabas of ancient Egypt, which is where a lot of the earlier burials took place. I like them a lot more than or pyramids as well. I also just think they're kind of a good sign of like the material body of matter. I couldn't even tell you why I put, like, I couldn't even tell you why, but that's just kind of how I view the trapezoid, is it represents the material world almost, which is why that's why where the body is buried. Pentagrams, to me, kind of represent the individual self. I like them with the point down because it represents balance. You know, it doesn't have to stand on two feet. It's perfectly balanced on that one point. I also just like that the pentagram is such an old symbol, you know, the oldest personal use I found of one has been 5th Dynasty Egypt, which is a long time ago. It was used as a religious symbol even before that in Sumer. And I just really liked that, uh, that tradition to it. And then there's also the aspect that, you know, the Western left-hand path is about separating and distinguishing yourself from culture. And, you know, a pentagram is just an easy way to do that. You know, if you wear a pentagram necklace or have a tattoo or something, it's 
a very easy way to separate yourself from culture in a symbolic way. And I do like that aspect of it as well. Hexagrams for me, I mostly treat the hexagram as an intermediary between the pentagram and the septagram, the five and seven point stars. I like most of the meaning given to it by groups like the Lima and stuff like that, you know, the balance and kind of wholeness. But to me, it's kind of like the pentagram represents the self here, and then the hexagram represents the journey, and the septagram represents the destination, almost like the, you know, the seven points of that septagram or heptagram, whatever you want to call it, is kind of self-perfection or the end goal, with seven being reflected, you know, such as the big stars and the big dipper of Satesh. Or the seven heavenly bodies that people used to see. It's why the number seven is so popular as it is. So I guess really the trapezoid to pentagram to hexagram to septagram is just a map of that journey from, you know, animal self to discovering true self to ascending to something greater to deification with the number seven. What is your pendant ties into this question. Uh, like I was saying, the trapezoid, it represents that physical self. It's important, you know, and it has to matter to you and you have to be happy with it, but it's also not even close to the totality of what you are. The pentagram in it stretches beyond the physical body because it's both contained here now and something greater than, to it. And then the wasp scepter is simply a symbol of Satesh. It was a symbol of power and dominion along with the symbol for Satesh that was used to denote him as an outcast, especially in the coffin text. So you have the self, the pentagram, within and beyond the physical body of the trapezoid, with Satesh, his power and outcast nature, right in the center of that. So really, the pentagram is me, as I am now, in this body, in this life. Are you a conspiracy theorist? <laughs> I think I have to give three different answers to that. First answer, as far as questioning how we know things, like for epistemology's sake, I think conspiracy theories are great because they really are kind of a form of philosophical skepticism at that point. Um, another way I guess I'm a conspiracy theorist is just for fun. I don't know if you've ever been on any of these conspiracy, you know, forums or websites, but some of those people are very endlessly entertaining and it can be a great way to just kind of laugh at the world instead of, you know, hate it by, you know, picking the mind of somebody who thinks that all the politicians are reptiles or something like that. I think it'd be great fun. And then there's the sense of what exactly even is a conspiracy, you know? Is it a conspiracy to believe that the CIA and NSA do bad things to the people of their own country? Or to people of other countries, even? It was once. Is it a conspiracy to think that pharmaceutical companies can do evil things like overcharge for insulin shots or charge people outrageous amounts of money for medications that they can't afford? Is it a conspiracy that Terrible abuse occurs at high levels of power around the world. You know, all these things have been called conspiracies and laughed at and stuff and then end up being true. And that's not to imply that every single conspiracy theory is true or even valid or anything like that. But I sometimes think conspiracy theorists is almost a witch hunt type accusation in some cases these days. I mean, you don't even have to believe a conspiracy is true to ask the questions. But I don't think people are really okay with that anymore. For probably some obvious reasons that aren't worth getting into here. What is physicalism and why do you not like it? Physicalism is the belief that all reduces to matter. The most controversial and common example being that the brain creates the mind and when the brain dies, the mind dies. Brevity. Um, okay, so the main problems with physicalism is that it doesn't have any evidence exclusive to it. 
Really, the only evidence physicalism gives us is that doing things to the brain causes changes to the mind, such as if you take a hammer to the brain, the mind might change. You know, you might even forget who you are, or forget how to do things. But that's not even exclusive to physicalism, because I believe that as well. You know, I believe that the mind and brain are different things interacting. So, of course, interacting with one would interact with, would affect the other. And so even if it's true that doing things to the brain does things to the mind, which I do think is true, it doesn't even imply physicalism because, I mean, I'm not a physicalist and I completely agree with that. That's completely true. We already discussed a lot how the mind and brain have different properties. I don't think we need to recount that out here because we've kind of gone over it already. Uh, the fact that you can't reduce what you know directly to what you know through it or can't reduce what you're certain of to what you can doubt. I think another important note is that not only does doing things to the brain affect the mind, but doing things to the mind affects the brain. For example, if you believe a pill works, it might cause change in you. That's what placebo is. There are monks who can, you know, put freezing cold towels on their bodies and willfully raise their body temperatures to make towels steam. There's things like cognitive behavioral therapy where therapy only works if you put in the willful work. You can't just take meds or reprogram yourself and then you're magically better. You know, there's not even a cure for most of those problems. The existence of free will. I don't think free will is possible underneath or under physicalism because everything would be determined by material processes. It doesn't allow any room for free will, which seems very obviously and scientifically to exist. I mean, we even know that if the brain tells a finger to push a button, there's a chance in there for the conscious mind to veto, you know, it's, it's not really a question anymore if we have free will. It's more a matter of explaining it. I also think that the idea that consciousness emerges from the brain doesn't really work. And I think a good example is people say wetness and water are different, but wetness emerges from water. Well, you can both feel water and wetness. You can both see water and see, for instance, perspiration or wetness. Likewise, people say that running emerges from legs, and so running is what legs do, like consciousness is what the brain does. But again, you can see both legs and someone running, or you can feel someone's legs with your hand, or feel the wind as they run past you. So all these things that are emerging share the properties of what they emerge from, material properties, whereas consciousness has no such thing. And so all other such examples of emergence are really not equivalent to what we have with consciousness and matter. I think the final one I'll just touch on for right now is the dangers of physicalism. You know, physicalism seeks to immediately discredit anything not in keeping with it as fringe or supernatural or something like that. To the point where you can't really investigate such things scientifically because you would it would be impossible to get funding for it. We automatically assume they're invalid, despite everything we've been talking about for the past hour or so. A good example that I actually learned about through Michael Aquino is Dr. Harold Burr in his life fields from Yale University. He found that there's this field that kind of determines how the body grows to the point where it could detect something like oncoming genetic defects in a fetus or how well a wound was healing. The problem was that Despite the amazing applications this could have, Burr thought that the existence of a life field implied the existence of God who created that life field. And because God cannot ex coexist with physicalism, Burr is pretty much considered a pseudoscientist, despite the fact that we're talking about a respected Yale doctor and dozens of associates with hundreds of experiments and endless empirical data. You know, it didn't lead him to conclude physicalism, so it must be wrong. And it's very sad that that's kind of what constitutes logic for us these days in a physicalist world. What is postmodernism and why do you not like it? <sighs> okay. The best way I found to explain it is the four stages of objects and symbols by Jean. I want to say his last name is Baudrillard, but I could have butchered that. And this pretty much can all be found in his Simulacra and Simulation book. But basically you have stage one where we have the polytheist, for instance, of Egypt, for instance. 
where objects were created because they served a purpose. It was either practical for everyday human life, or it was practical for the gods, which they very much believed were real. Their symbols also were representative of things real. You know, when they drew a god, they weren't describing a force of nature or something like that. They were trying to interpret the god itself. Whereas today we might just get a statue without any like, oh, that looks cool. You know, it, it was describing objective reality at the time, whereas today it doesn't really do that. And I think that this represents kind of the first stage Bouldrillard talked about. So the polytheists were trying to describe all of reality, both the material and the spiritual, and their symbols and objects were related to that objective reality. Stage two, I think we have monotheism, where a reality is acknowledged, the existence of an objective reality. But it's more about twisting that reality to fit a new perspective. So instead of there being multiple gods, you know, you have one god and everything else is demons. Instead of, I think a good, abort, a, good, a, a good example would be, you know, in the second stage, you might think abortion is inherently immoral because you believe in an objective reality, but it's just warped. Whereas in the first stage, you would understand that abortion is a very complicated topic. And thus cannot be so understood as easily as in the second stage. And I know that's, this is kind of complicated. I'll try to tie it all together at the end. The third, third stage is kind of represented by physicalism. You know, we now deny aspects of reality, such as the existence of the gods or the divine or anything like that. And this leads to, you know, moral relativism. There's no more, there's not an objective real morality, nor is there an objective morality that's been twisted, but it's all just relative. You know, morality is just what a culture determines and it's not objective at all. Postmodernism is the fourth stage of this. Postmodernism not only ignores aspects of objective reality, but ignores reality altogether and replaces it with something else. I think one of the best illustrations of this is how all media is now self-referential. It's not even referencing reality or reference. It's just, it references its own created and self-sustained reality in order to distract you from reality. It also leads to a bad morality where not only is morality not objective, but we also can't really call it relative. It's more that morality is whatever people of high symbol and object values say is moral. To explain what I mean by the symbol object value is remember how in stage one, such as Egypt, objects and symbols were used practically or as part of objective reality. For example, if you need a place to sit, you simply need a chair. It doesn't need to be anything fancy. Or a statue might describe a god that was thought to objectively exist. Whether it's true that that god existed or, exists or not is irrelevant. The Egyptians believed it was true, that it described reality. Let's compare this to our postmodern world where an unbelievably uncomfortable chair that you can barely sit on may cost thousands of dollars because it was made by a designer. Whereas a perfectly fine chair that's comfortable and cheap not only doesn't bring much money to the maker, but doesn't give you any kind of social value either. You know, you get more social value from the expensive designer chair that you can't even use than the comfortable, affordable chair because objects have no connection to reality anymore, only the self-created reality. Another example might be how two identical shirts can differ by hundreds of dollars in cost simply by the name that's on the tag inside. You know, we don't care that they're objectively the same shirt. We care about the pseudo reality of wearing, you know, such and such famous people's person's brand. The same is true of symbols, you know, our symbols, we don't use symbols to describe the gods or aspects of reality anymore. I say that a lot of people are like me and they have altars in their house, but unlike altars to the gods and to spiritual reality and stuff like that, they're altars to corporations and products and consumer things that they're taught to have. And so instead of surrounding them with something that gets them closer in touch with reality as it is, it, it deepens their connection with the pseudo reality that's been created for them to distract them from reality. And I think that's a key to postmodernism. 
Social media is another good example. For instance, a lot of social media, you're limited by a word count to the point where now if you post an essay somewhere on a forum or something, if it's longer than that word count, people are just going to call it a word salad. Like they can't even fathom that you can have an idea that couldn't fit in 160 characters. And that just doesn't describe reality at all. All these, you know, touched up selfies and vacation pics and documenting only the good parts of our lives. These, again, completely, they not only ignore aspects of reality, but they add a additional layer of fiction into the reality you do embrace and share with other people. It's kind of the central, central problem of um, selfie culture. And the worst part about it is it's only going to get worse because there's a fifth stage coming thanks to artificial intelligence and virtual reality. You know, soon people might not even remember reality because they never leave their virtual one. And that virtual reality, I can assure you, is filled not with spiritual symbols and esoteric knowledge, but with product placement and consumer propaganda and political propaganda. I'm sure I have a ton, ton more to say on postmodernism, but I think that I think that gives like a good kind of intro to it. Is is this modern phase where people of high symbol and object value dictate our morality and only self-referential reality matters. We don't care about reality at all anymore. Like the objective, true, spiritual, physical reality. Just nobody cares about it. They just care about the celebrities and their designer stuff. What is monism and why do you not like it? This was another Reddit question, I believe. Monism is any position that believes everything rejects, reduces to one substance. So physicalism is actually a form of monism. It's physical monism. But it's more, well, but it's pretty common for there to be spiritual monism as well, which is, you know, we all emanate from one God or there's one grounded center of all being, you know, one creator, one purpose, stuff like that. Most of the reasons why I've already argued for both polytheism and against physicalism actually apply here. For example, substance or property dualism between mind and brain suggests that they're two separate things, not that all is mind or all is matter. Uh, we have two-way causality instead of just consciousness affecting matter, just matter affecting consciousness. Emergence also doesn't work because we're still dealing with something with two mutually exclusive properties. You know, even if spirit is the monistic center of all things, then matter contradicts the properties of that. How could that be possible? I also have a problem with monism because as we discussed early on, the self is, as far as we can tell as a God, the soul is the I and I exist. It, it can't be reduced. It can't be questioned or doubted or anything like that. And so how could we possibly say that that self is an illusion or emanation of something greater, whether that be the light of, a monad or God, or it be just matter itself. I think we can accept the existence of these multiple substances beyond a reasonable doubt, especially like matter and consciousness. The lack of uniformity in consciousness and in nature as it is, the lack of perfection or anything like that also seems to suggest to me that we're dealing with multiple sources rather than some perfect or all-encompassing, determining force. Not only this, but just the wealth of experiences people have had with plurality as opposed to oneness, I think makes it at least on par validity-wise with experiences of oneness. But they go back so much further and have been reported so much longer and reported before someone came in and told you that if you reported something other than it, you would, you know, be in great danger. And finally, I think the problem of evil applies to monism as much as it applies to any kind of monotheism. I think the only way around it is if whatever is the monistic center doesn't care, isn't responsible for anything, or doesn't have power, in which case, I don't know why we would believe it would... I think that would contradict all the arguments made for the need to, the, to be, for there to be such a ground of reality. All right, we're almost finished here. Just a couple more questions. What paranormal experiences have you had? 
Uh, this is going to be way too brief. If anybody's interested, I can go into another episode entirely on this. Um, I grew up in a haunted house, very haunted. Um, I mentioned that I worked in a movie theater that was on an Indian reservation. Lots of very strange things happened there, witnessed by many, many people. Over the course of years, we still talk about them today. Um, my friends and I, for probably close to two decades, have done rituals together. You know, callings to things in the forest and dances around the fire and stuff like that and had some very significant reactions of that that I think would probably be better suited for the group podcast that we're planning on working on, so I'll leave it for there. The wilderness here, just around the land in Arizona, there's been plenty of weird things that happen. We've been chased by some unseen, crazy-sounding thing that everybody just inherently was terrified of the moment they heard it. We all ran without even communication that anyone thought anything was wrong. You know, multiple people breaking down in the same spot and then reporting strange experiences around them in the desert. Uh, skinwalkers. Shit, one of my friends, a friend of one of my friends has caught one on video. We've seen them off-roading in the mountains, off in the distance. Skinwalkers or whatever else you want to call them. You know, I'm, I'm totally open to the there being other kinds of things out there. And then I think most importantly for me has been what's known as synchronicity, which is where events gain significance only through their esoteric importance to you. So for example, one of the most significant instances of that was when some of my friends and I were discussing the significance of a scarab beetle to Egypt. And then we saw a scarab beetle crawling across the yard. This itself would have been a synchronicity, but we then decided to look into synchronicities since we had just been dis learning about them recently. And the story that Carl Jung uses to describe synchronicity involves a young woman who dreamt about a scarab. And while she was telling Jung about it, they heard a tapping at the window and it turned out to be a scarab. So we were talking about a scarab, saw a scarab, looked up, the explanation to why those two events would have been significantly tied in our mind. And the explanation was also scarabs, scarabs all the way down. <laughs> so yeah, um, that's, that's just one example. You know, I think synchronicity is a great guide to kind of esoteric practice and, you know, tells you kind of where to focus your importance or if you're doing things right or wrong and what ideas are kind of important for the here and now. Well, this is probably the longest I've ever talked consistently and in this kind of one-sided way in my entire life. So I'm honestly a bit burnt. I know I still have to edit this. There are still some questions, but I think we covered kind of the biggest ones. Um, please do let me know what interested you, if anything, and I can dive more into that in future videos future recordings, whatever it ends up being. But I hope this has kind of just been informative and given kind of a good insight into where I'm coming from that might not be taken away from simply reading my, you know, philosophical writings and hopefully introduce somewhat of a more personal level to this whole wandering and darkness thing. So I thank you very much for listening. Extra thanks to those who made it this far all the way to the end. Please let me know what you would like to hear more of, if anything, and I will see you next time.